You know, sometimes we say we want a Book of Acts revival. And I wonder if we really know what we're asking for. Do you realize that there were three people in the book of Acts that were smitten dead before God? There was a leader that was eaten of worms because he gave not God the glory. Do you want a revival that something like that may happen? There were two that were smitten dead where they stood one after the other for lying to the Holy Spirit. That's New Testament. That's a book of Acts revival. There was a man who was a false prophet in Acts chapter 13 by the name of Bar-Jesus. I don't know about you, but when I think of Jesus, I think of Joshua, somebody who leads us out of sin, out of Egypt. But there was a Bar-Jesus. There's a lot of Bar-Jesuses in the 21st century. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. Being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work they are reprobate. There are prophets who promise liberty, but are of themselves servants of corruption. That's what your Bible says. Bar Jesus. And when he got on the wrong side of things in the book of Acts, the Bible said, Paul said, the hand of the Lord is upon you. And you will go out of this place blind for a season. That's a book of Acts revival. Has there anybody read the book of Acts? I realize we're Pentecostal. We ought to have memorized that book. The Bible said over and over again, great fear came upon the people when they saw these things. There was a combination of a reverential fear of the Lord mixed with the love and joy of the Holy Ghost. A mix that only God can bring. That on the one hand says, come to me because I love you. But the other hand says, you can't keep living like that. You need to forsake that. Some people say Paul the Apostle preached nothing but grace. But when we get to Acts 26, we find he was just another voice crying in the wilderness. Repent and prepare you the way of the Lord. He preached it to the Jews. He preached it to the Gentiles. Everywhere he went, Paul's message was repent. Read it. Paul said, I was not unfaithful to the heavenly vision, but I preached it. This is a book of Acts revival. This is a book of Acts revival. Would you feel comfortable walking around with kind of a little bit of a nervousness about you because God was so close? Before you went to say what you was about to say, you was already checked. Because God was so close. You're already in a state of check. The first thing God had to do to Isaiah was put a coal to his lips because he needed to purge by the fire of God the words coming out of his mouth. When the fire of God gets on us, we'll be in a state of check all the time. Do we want a book of Acts revival? I'm asking you. You're going to have to prepare yourself. You're going to have to get out of television Christianity. You're going to have to get off the radio because it's not there. It's in the book of Acts. 120 people came out of the room on fire for God and turned the world upside down. They didn't talk about it. By the time we get to the second century, the gospel had already made it to the shores of Great Britain. You didn't lie to the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts. Not in the presence of God's people because they would have carried your bones out. You didn't start trifling with God when he was moving by his spirit. There were other people killed, too, for their faith. 
because they took such a strong stand for God. James was beaten to death by a fuller's club. And Stephen was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. Page after page of confrontation. Page after page of nervous fear. God's present. God is here. He loves us. Let's go. Let's take this gospel. The times of this ignorance God has overlooked, but now He's commanding all men everywhere to repent. Because He has appointed a day in which He is going to judge the world in righteousness. This is the gospel. This is the gospel according to Paul. This is the gospel according to Peter. It's the message of John the Baptist. Turn away from all of your sins and turn to Christ with all of your heart. Walk before God with no conscious sin in your life. I don't care what you've done. God will forgive you. But you can't keep doing it. You can't keep doing it. You've got to turn. Because God's presence can't come on us in the way He wants to if we think we're going to entertain sin. The old timers used to say God's presence withdrawn means judgment's been delayed. But when God's presence is near, judgment is swift. Do you want a book of Acts revival? Or are we going to dance around our golden calf for another hundred years? A forgery of Jesus that was never really the one who is the exalted one. Just one main after our own lusts that meets our needs that we can play around. Listen, you don't play around the one who sits on the throne. Do you realize there are cherubim and seraphim, even as we are speaking, that are crying, holy, holy, holy. We have got to get a revelation of who we're serving. If we don't, there's no hope for us. Listen to me, there's no hope. We've tried all the programs. There's more seminars going on in America than there's probably ever been in our history. Everybody's trying to do church growth, everything under the sun. Except what we need to do. We've got to get back to the book of Acts. How did they do it? They prepared themselves for an outpouring. They prepared themselves. Weeks and weeks they prepared themselves. They weren't probably sitting around twiddling their thumbs. They were preparing for an outpouring. Do you realize that God wants to cleanse the temple because He don't want to live in junk? And God doesn't just come and visit us and just leave. He wants to come and live in here and stay. He wants you to walk in His presence. In His manifest presence. Nothing is holy if God is not there. That's what holiness is. And when God comes, He's going to come like He's always came. I've read the book. And everywhere he always came, he expected to things to line up. Read the book of Acts. Now, the children of Israel didn't know that. They made him a golden calf and they just danced. They thought, well, we're going to serve God in the way that the pagans serve God, like we did in Egypt. We're just going to heap all of our worship like we did it there on top of this man-made God. But, you know, God's not receiving that. Hear what I'm telling you. God's not receiving it. He's holy. And we have to prepare ourselves. Are you prepared for God to pour His Spirit out? I'm just asking you. Are you prepared to attend possibly some funerals? Did you know the first Great Awakening was accompanied by two funerals that sparked it? Did you know that? Northampton. Jonathan Edwards was preaching. God started moving. The teenagers used to laugh at the preacher in the back of the church. 
Jonathan Edwards wrote about it. He tells the story. He said they used to kind of sit back and mock. He said, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Northampton. And when he did, he said there became a nervousness among the people. And then all of a sudden, a young man just mysteriously up and died after Jonathan Edwards had preached a message. And they took it as a sign from God. And let me tell you, when somebody drops over dead, that gets your attention. And then a young woman fell dead. She was saved. And on her deathbed, she was begging the people to turn to Christ. She begged them. Let me tell you, a deathbed confession is oftentimes valid in court. Listen to somebody on their deathbed. They'll tell you. She was begging them. God poured out His Spirit in such a way that it was so supernatural, so sovereign, that He wrote a book about it. It was published. And it got into the hands of none other than John Wesley. And the revival that was sparked in Northampton that became the first great awakening spread to England at a time when France was in civil war. And a lot of scholars tell us that England was spared the civil war that took place in France because of a man named John Wesley and the first great awakening. How did it begin? God poured his spirit out. A couple people dropped dead. And people started serving God in the way He wants to be served. And it gave birth to a nation. That's why we're here today. How many of you are thankful for revival? I'm glad God sent a revival. But an outpouring of the Holy Ghost isn't what we think it is. Hear what I'm telling you. We're looking for goosebumps. We're looking for feel good. We're looking for a lot of weird things. But when God comes, you're going to get nervous. People are going to come in here and get real nervous. Not because we're weirding out, but because there's a presence here. They're not going to be able to sit in the sanctuary and go out unchanged. They're going to be confronted by the Holy Spirit. They're going to meet God right here. I didn't mean to preach to you this morning. But as I was just praying over there, God just laid this into my heart. Do you want a book of Acts revival? Because if you do, you need to prepare for it. We have to prepare our hearts. You need to go through your life. And if there's anything in your life, God's got his hand on. You need just to repent of it. The Lord loves you. If I were to tell you all of my sins right now, you'd be horrified. And as I said in Sunday school class, you'd be disillusioned. But we need to be dissed of our illusions. God will forgive you where you are, but he wants to take the sin from you. He wants you to give it to him. He wants your conscience to be able to lie down so you can serve him eye to eye. I don't know about you, but sometimes Holy Ghost conviction gets old. Anybody ever tired of just being convicted? Can I just keep it real? Wouldn't it be so much better to walk in the joy of the Lord face to face with God? How are you doing, Brother Robert? Brother, I'm blessed. Praise His name forever. You're a revival looking for a place to happen. Why? Because your conscience is clear between you and God. There's no, there's absolutely no controversy there. Is it okay for me to say this? You have no idea if you've never been there how glorious what I'm talking about is. You have no idea. You have no idea. You could walk one day and what I'm talking about, you'd never turn back. The freedom, the liberty to know that all is well with my soul. All is well with my soul. Amen. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength.
The joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm going to change up the words. If you want joy, you must repent of that. If you want joy, you must turn from that. And if you want joy, you must stop doing that. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Hmm? Do you want a book of Acts revival? I've been in revival. This feels like a prayer meeting when I was a young man, about 22. I can feel God here. Can you? Can anybody feel God here? I could stay in the presence of God. And He loves us. He wants to wrap His arms around us and just tell us, I love you. But I want to clean you up. Because you can't live like this. The place where you're coming, we don't allow this stuff. The place where you're going to live, we don't tolerate it. There's some people under the sound of my voice that have never received the Holy Spirit. And you wonder why. The Bible said the Holy Spirit is given to those that obey the Lord. Read the book of Acts. Until you have a disposition to want to obey God, you can't resist the Holy Ghost and receive Him at the same time. If God's got His hand on something in your life, you need to repent of it. Is that hard to do? Sometimes it is. Because, you know, sometimes our sins can become like lovers. We get into a personal relationship with our sins. And it's almost like telling somebody you need to get out of that abusive relationship you're in. People get defensive. That's how you know your sin's personal. Private. You want to hold on. But you know what? If you'll turn it over to God. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I told about a brother this morning was biting his nails. That sounds crazy. God said, quit biting your nails. Listen, if God tells you quit biting your nails, obey God. What, what's he telling you to do? It's not always some big, huge thing that we always think. He's not going to tell you, well, you know, if you go to China, then I'll give you the Holy Spirit. No, he just wants you to submit because you're coming into a kingdom. And there's a king. And you've got to obey. Amen. There's no such thing as a kingdom without a king. We're his subjects. And once we subject ourselves to him in a way he can believe us, he'll fill us with his spirit. What's God is, does God got his hand on anything in your life? All you've got to do is say, Lord, I renounce this. I renounce this thing. I rebuke this in the name of Jesus. Lord, I confess this to you right now. Lord, I, for, I repent for having done this in your sight. And Lord, give me the grace and strength to never do it again. And you determine that's it. God, by your grace, we're not going back to this. Amen. It's not difficult. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Let's just pray. Lord, we're so thankful that you love us. Lord, we feel your love this morning. We feel your presence. We feel your goodness. We feel the warmth of your embrace. Lord, we feel your arms coming around us even now. Lord, and you're saying, I want to clean you up on the inside. I want you to turn the controversy over once and for all. Lord, you sent your Holy Spirit to be in the place of Jesus Christ. And even as the rich young ruler that you spoke with, so too the Spirit is speaking in the hearts even now. And he's saying one thing or something or some things. Go and Go and fill in the blank. What is God telling you to do? What's He telling you to do? If you will do what He tells you and quit thinking that 
you can somehow dupe yourself or even dupe God. Lord, help us to see what You're clearly showing us. What Your hand is upon. No more playing games. No more playing mind games with ourselves. Telling ourselves that we can do this or that and You don't care when the truth is the proof is in the pudding and we're not moving in joy. We're not moving in love. We're not moving in the power of the Spirit. Help us to recognize this morning. In Jesus' name. I wonder if there's one here this morning that you'd say, Brother Robert, before you go today, I would like special prayer. And if I were sitting in the congregation, I'd be the first to say, I will take prayer. Is there any here this morning? Say, I would like prayer. All right. We have some over here. Is there anyone else? We want to pray for you. The Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. The Lord loves you this morning. He cares about you.